are delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Dettol, Banega Swast India. This session is presented by the York University. It is our pleasure to present today, Higher Learning, Tradition and Innovation. Charlie Jeffrey, Shalendra Raj Mehta, and Sandeep Sethi in conversation with Malashri Lal, introduced by Rashmi Sharma. As societies evolve, so must systems of learning. Education and innovation are indispensable to realities present and in wait. Experts in education and its many shifting frameworks come together to discuss abundant possibilities for higher learning. Professor Charlie Jeffrey is the Vice Chancellor and President at the University of York. He is interested in the optimal service research and believes that education can render to social and economic welfare. Shalindra Raj Mehta is an Indian economist, president and director at Maika Ahmedabad, and a member of the Mission High Level Committee of the Indian Knowledge System. Sandeep Sethi is Director of Education at MSMS2 Museum Trust, Jaipur. He has conceptualized educational models which challenge societal barriers and are grounded by inclusivity and ideation. In conversation with esteemed writer and academic, Malashri Lal, they discuss the fundamental and forward-looking dimensions of learning. Introduced by Dr. Rashmi Sharma, State Project Director, Samagra Shiksha, and Additional Commissioner, Rajasthan Council of School Education and Commissioner, School Shiksha, Jaipur. Charlie Jeffrey. Charlie Jeffrey is Vice Chancellor and President, University of York, and former Senior Vice President at the University of Edinburgh. His academic background is in the study of politics. He is passionate about the role universities can play in bringing benefit to the places in which they are located. Jeffrey is currently working with further and higher education institutes, private sector partners, and local authorities in and around York in shaping economic development programs in the field of biotechnology and around York Central, one of UK's biggest brownfield development sites. Shalendra Raj Mehta. Shalendra Raj Mehta is the President, Director, and Distinguished Professor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at MICA in Ahmedabad, India. Earlier, he headed Oro University and Ahmedabad University. Before that, he had stints at Duke CE and the Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad and Purdue University, where he taught economics and strategic management. Sandeep Sethi. Sandeep Sethi is Director, Education, MSMS2 Museum Trust, Jaipur, and alumnus of Narsi Moenji. Sethi is an educationist to the core and a firm believer of experiential pedagogies. He thinks out of the box and believes in making education fun by experimenting, evolving, collaborating, and sharing experiences. Sethi pioneered education through theater, and develop the pedagogy of studies through graphic novels at the Jaipur History Festival. Malashri Lal. Malashri Lal is an academic editor and writer with 16 books to her credit. She retired as a professor from the English department of the University of Delhi with a specialization in literature and gender studies. Lal was senior consultant to the Ministry of Culture and is an active member of International Book Award juries. She is currently on the English Advisory Board of the Sahitya Academy. Rashmi Sharma. Rashmi Sharma is the State Project Director of Samagra Shiksha and Commissioner of School Education, Government of Rajasthan. She has been in public service since 1994 and has worked across various social sectors including health and women's empowerment. Sharma was instrumental in enabling the rural poor to increase their household income through sustainable livelihood enhancements in Ajivika, National Rural Livelihoods Mission. 
Sharma has an MPhil in Public Administration and a PhD in Motivation and Morale. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comment section. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Please tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2022 and tag at the rate Jaipur Lit Fest. Ladies and gentlemen, we present to you Higher Learning, Tradition and Innovation. Charlie Jeffrey, Shailendra Raj Mehta, and Sandeep Sethi in conversation with Mala Srilal, introduced by Rashmi Sharma. A very, very warm welcome to all of you in the pink city, Jaipur, and we are here again in the beautiful Jaipur Literature Festival. So it's, it's a privilege indeed to welcome Professor Charlie Jeffrey, who's the VC and President, University of York. Welcome. Professor, uh, Professor Shailendra Raj Mehta, who is heading president and director at MICA Institute, uh, an institute uh, par excellence. Dr. Sandeep Sethi, coming from Pink City itself. Welcome, uh, Mr. Sethi. As we heard, you are into so many other uh, things apart from the, the basic hardcore education sector. So you're director of education in uh, MSMS here in the Museum Trust. And none other than uh, Dr. Dr. Professor Mala Shri, who has been a great uh, academician and, uh, and an expert in gender and other issues, and a great host and an author. So, uh, I, I, Mr. Uh, Professor Mala, you would be in conversation with all the panelists. So, just to uh, welcome you all on behalf of the state government, uh, I would just like to share a few uh, things uh, which we were facing in the past few years. So, you are all aware that the uh, pandemic was a big hit for all of us, especially for school children. And uh, we had to struggle and we managed somehow to get out of uh, this and the schools have reopened again. So it was a very, very difficult time when we, uh, we were dealing with a lot of digital divide. We were using a lot of other mechanisms uh, like a hybrid learning uh, methodology. We were using online classes and uh, I am sure all of you are aware how difficult it is to uh, connect with the children when you are teaching online. So a lot of uh, these things happen. Still I, uh, sharing with you, I am privileged to share that uh, we in the government sector, uh, we managed to have a jump of enrollment of students in the school for about uh, an increase of about 10 lakhs. And the most interesting thing was that out of those 10 lakhs, 50% were girls. So if I may say that uh, we were able to achieve uh, some positivity out of this uh, negative atmosphere, we were able to do so. So um, uh, talking about higher learning, there is, I mean, you're all aware, you're experts that there has been a paradigm shift. So children are no longer going into stereotypes and the usual buckets of subjects. They are trying to choose subjects which are par excellence. They're trying to choose subjects which, uh, which are niche, uh, like uh, something like we study in MICA. There is absolutely a different set of uh, things they are being taught there. And so children are choosing their options. So as the new education policy is already in place uh, since 2020, we are no longer re getting restricted in the subject-wise uh, categories. We are, we are having options. Children are wanting to study not only in good institutions in India, but they are also keen to study abroad. So the, what the state can do is, uh, uh, it's, it's a very limited thing. We can push children to have a very nice school education background. As Mr. Sandeep was saying, we have to also take into account various other things, like not only the academics part, we also look up to, you know, if they're the girls, we are also trying to give them self-defense training. We are also trying to give them cyber, uh, you know, uh, the sort of a cover against the cyber bullying, which goes hand in hand when they start using so much of digital equipments. So uh, we, we are also trying to catch hold of all other support. And at the same time, we are also supporting them in terms of pursuing their academics in higher education uh, in uh, other uh, cont abroad, countries abroad also. So that kind of funding is also being provided to a few meritorious students who just uh, top in the 10th class so that they can uh, achieve certain heights in the areas uh, of their interest. 
So, uh, uh, the, of course, their career options are wide and it would be great to have insights from all of you and to learn from you and your expertise. So, a uh, very, very warm welcome to you, all of you again and in the Pink City. Thank you very much, uh, Rashmi Sharma. And I'm so glad that you tracked the connection between school education and higher learning. You're absolutely right in suggesting that the national education policy 2020 in India has highlighted that continuum and that the pandemic in many ways has accelerated the rate of change at which education was rethinking for itself. And we have gone into a kind of a paradigm shift, not only in India, but I think all over the world, because the phenomenon of having to teach from home to devise all kinds of uh, exercises and assignments online, to think in terms of hybrid modes of learning, to wonder how to get research done when students and teachers are not able to meet in physical space. All of this has made it necessary to innovate on the idea of higher education. And of course, as we are all aware, that higher education doesn't start in undergraduate first year. It actually is picking up from where the students are coming from. And the new education policy notes that we've got to look at achieving the personal accomplishment and enlightenment of the student. We're also in a way responsible for creating education that brings students into a constructive public engagement and further, and I like this very much indeed, that there must be a productive contribution to society through the education that we are giving. So the old idea of uh, higher learning or higher education being a sort of rarefied academic discipline of books and a philosophy of education has actually been uh, challenged and opened up in another direction of education that is higher learning and research, but it also has a purpose. And that purpose is to develop certain tools within society for the upliftment of all and to respect the diversity of any country where the education segment is operational. So with that kind of a thought that I have, I would like to request our three eminent panelists to present their viewpoints their vision, their achievements, their hopes and aspirations for the education sector. So may I first call upon Professor Charlie Jeffrey, the Vice Chancellor and President of the University of York to present his views, please. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and what a pleasure it is to be at the Jaipur Literary Festival. Uh, I've had a long association with the Edinburgh International Book Festival and we have a brilliant annual festival uh, of ideas in York, but this is perhaps the, the most important forum for ideas and creativity in the world. And I, I'm really sorry we can't actually be together in Jaipur, perhaps, perhaps next year. Um, I, I wanted to play a little bit on the title of, of this session about tradition and innovation in, in higher learning. Uh, that resonates very much with the way we're thinking at the University of York since I became Vice Chancellor two and a half years ago. When I came, my first thought was to get under the skin of the university and, and to work out what the founding uh, fathers and mothers of the university 60 years ago were, were thinking about. Uh, and I found two foundational statements of purpose in the university archives, which, which I think are quite extraordinary. The first was from one of our benefactors at, at the launch, uh, and they felt that the university should conduct studies which contribute to the amelioration of human life and conditions. In other words, no ivory tower here. We were, we were there for public benefit. Uh, the second one, this was uh, something my, uh, the, the first vice chancellor said. He, he said, we should care about opening up the opportunity for higher education to those who've not had it more than almost anything else. We should unleash the benefits of higher education to the disadvantaged, to the marginalized. Now, we've been thinking very hard about how we can translate those purposes uh, for today. And I think they set my university and perhaps all universities two tasks. The first is to nurture innovation. There has been no 
economic or social advance of significance in the last 50 years that can't be traced back to universities, whether through the discovery of new knowledge by academics or by the application of, of that knowledge by our graduates as they move into their careers. So that's task number one. Task number two is inclusion. I think we, we should be working hard today to open up the possibility of higher education to those who today are disadvantaged or, or marginalized so that they also have the opportunity to participate in the economic and social benefit, the public benefit that universities bring. So innovation and inclusion. I'm gonna to add to that a third task and that's partnership. I am very firmly of the view that we can achieve more if we work with like-minded partners than if we are acting alone. We can innovate more, we can include more. Uh, and I'd like to give two brief current examples at, at the University uh, of York. The, the first is an absolutely brilliant program called Bio Yorkshire, which rests on decades of brilliant biotechnology research and innovation at the University of York uh, on agricultural efficiency and increasingly on the use of agricultural products as a feedstock for producing plastics and energy so that we can reduce our dependence on oil. Brilliant science, brilliant science. But now, because we're working in partnership with specialist agricultural colleges, government environment labs, local authorities, businesses large and small, that science is now at the heart of a collective commitment to make our region the first carbon negative region in the UK. Not carbon zero, carbon negative. Now that for me is, is about the power of partnership, translating our innovation into public benefit. Second example, uh, there are parts of our region where, where old industries have failed, haven't been replaced, and they've left communities in poverty and disadvantage. We are now working with partners in other universities, charitable trusts, community organizations to build long-term programs from primary school upwards to open up the aspiration among children and their families and their communities that university is right for them as well as for people from more disadvantaged backgrounds. Now, in some of the areas we're working in, currently 10% uh, of school leavers uh, go on to university. The UK average is about 50%. We're working with partners. We're confident we can get that up to 60% in those communities, which have very, very few uh, children going on to university now. Again, the power of partnership to include more in the public benefit that universities can bring. Uh, let me say a little finally about the scope, the reach of that approach on innovation, inclusion uh, and partnership. My examples have been very much at the local level in York. Uh, they don't need to be, they shouldn't have to be just about York. Another of our founding principles of the university was internationalism, the belief that we have much to learn from other nations, places, cultures. And more than that though, the cross fertilization of ideas from different places is what sparks new knowledge and what opens up that innovation uh, process. Um, for example, some of that biotechnology work I, I spoke about, we have lots of good collaborations in India, thinking about the ways in which we can uh, develop agriculture more efficiently or use agricultural products for new net zero purposes. And I think we can say the same for inclusion. Uh, the COVID era has been one of extraordinary difficulty and impact and, 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 and real challenge for universities, but it's also been a disruptor in a positive sense. We have found out that we can provide platforms and contents for learning online that are really, really good and which are also borderless. They can engage with students wherever they might be in, in the world. So if indeed we care more than anything else about opening up the opportunity for higher education, we now have much, much better opportunities and skills to work with partners around the world to include more in that opportunity for public benefit that higher education can bring. That for me is such a, an exciting prospect, Manu. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Jeffrey, for uh, 
signposting the idea of inclusive education and innovation and partnership. And uh, uh, this is a good point to transit to our next speaker, Professor Shailendra Raj Mehta, who's heading MICA, which is the most uh, innovation-centered um, programs in management and entrepreneurship. And uh, Professor Mehta, you also have an interest in Indian knowledge systems. So this point of how the traditional knowledge and the new knowledge, how these things can get combined, how we can create new educational patterns, which uh, bring the best of the old and link it to today's requirements, because the relevance of education is something which everyone is now worrying about. And when we have uh, issues in science and agriculture, as Professor Jeffrey was just mentioning, I'm sure there are contexts that your organization and you have been attending to. So it would be very enlightening if Professor Mehta could tell us about new programs, about the, the social linkages for science, research, management, developmental, economics, etc. So, of course, I uh, would leave the details to Professor Mehta, whichever way he wants to take this discussion forward. So over to you. Thank you, Professor Lal. Um, I will stick to your brief and uh, I will actually talk about some aspects of tradition that are very important to emphasize as technology is undergoing a revolution, right? And as modes of instruction are revolutionizing. I will also build on what Prof Professor Jeffrey just pointed out. In fact, he talked about innovation, inclusion and partnership. And these are foundational values of the university for a very interesting reason. So let me focus on that. 500 years ago, uh, if you look back, uh, so Clark Kerr, who was the founder of the University of California system, the founding chancellor, he said that in 1520, uh, there were some institutions of which only 85 have survived 500 years later, right? 70 of them are universities. So, um, uh, the, and the only other ones that have survived are the parliaments of uh, Iceland, of Great Britain and the Isle of Man, the Catholic Church, several Swiss cantons and only one bank, okay? So the profit motive is not something on which you can build a long lasting institution. And technically, actually universities emerge rather late in human history uh, because they, are in, they solve an incredibly difficult problem, incredibly difficult problem, because knowledge creation is not something that can happen in the marketplace. Why? Two reasons. The public benefit is far greater than the private benefit, right? So nobody would want to personally invest in education, number one. And number two, and this is even more important than the first one, education has what economists call externalities, right? If you are a bright student and I come and learn with you, I will learn a lot more from you. On the other hand, if I'm a very poor student, your learning will be impacted negatively. So therefore you want in a class, the very best students that you can possibly put together, not those who have the ability to pay. And this creates a contradiction that the market cannot solve. So this problem was solved only about 25, 2600 years ago in India for the first time, when the uh, seven ancient universities came up in Takshala, in Nalanda, Vikramshil, Odantapuri, Jagaddal, Sompura, and Vallabhi, we tend to forget that for 1800 years, India led in higher education and the whole world came to India, not just to Takshala, but also to Nalanda and Vallabhi and everywhere else, including Alexander, so-called the great. Uh, he spent time in Takshala. This is there in Plutarch's lives. I don't, uh, so, um, so, all the, so what do we learn from them? Well, the, the foundational principle is basically that higher education has to be driven by values of building knowledge of people, culture, and identity. It cannot be focused on profit, cannot be focused on power, has to be focused on purpose. And uh, in the Udyog Parva of the Mahabharata from at least the fifth century BC, it says very clearly that four things have to come together for learning to happen. The teacher, Acharya, this, and it says Swamedha, that is the intellect of the learner, right? The person has to come and engage. Third, Saha Brahmachari Bhya, that is the fellow learners. And fourth is time. If you think about it, this is the best formula that you can find for education. Teachers, yourself, fellow learners, and time. 
This is the formula for education. And uh, the uh, think about it. Uh, if you had landed up in uh, Chanakya's class on political economy at Takshala in the third century BC, right? He was a contemporary of um, the great Greek thinkers. You would have recognized that class, even though there was no writing involved. It was entirely oral. Remember, that was epoch one. After that, there were 11 other epochs. Writing then was introduced. That was number two. Then manuscripts, then paper, then textbooks, then radio, then cassette tape and CDs, then TV, then satellite instruction, then videotape and DVDs, then internet, and now MOOCs. But the fundamentals have not changed. What are the fundamentals? Learning, number one, is a social experience. Privately, you can only do so much. Number two, it needs a teacher who looks you in the eye to see if you've understood and who engages in a conversation with you, a dialogue, a samvad, if you like. So unless you have motivated working professionals who can learn by themselves, and by the way, um, in Britain, uh, the Open University was introduced to cater to such individuals, and they just used correspondence courses, right? And they were self-motivated. You did not need anything else. But for beginning learners, by which I mean all young adults or below, they need a teacher, they need a social environment in which that happens. So I thought I would uh, point these out, and this has not changed over 2,600 years and will not change. Unfortunately, a lot of discussion that we have around technology seems to believe that if you just allow students to engage with technology, but not with the teacher or with them or with each other, that you will have education, that's a big myth. So my point with which I will close is that no matter what technology we bring into the classroom and somehow we are becoming very enamored of that, these two constants, fellow learners and a teacher who looks you in the eye are not going to change. So with that, uh, Professor Lal, back to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mehta, for bringing up some significant points about the history of higher education and the systems by which we learn from each other. It's a good point to transit uh, in this discussion to Mr. Sandeep Sethi, because uh, located where he is, in the City Palace Museum and Trust in Jaipur, and with his interest in school children's education, his uh, absolutely remarkable work with heritage studies and uh, the experiment that is being carried out of taking heritage to school students so that we are upturning the idea of a formal education and integrating it what, what used to be called informal education. In fact, it seems to me that those old barriers have gone and should go some more. The barriers between formal university and distance learning, that between uh, skill developed learning and academic research and school to higher learning being a kind of a hierarchy. So I would turn now to Mr. Sandeep Sethi and uh, request him to speak of his area of expertise and how higher learning and school education are very intimately tied together. Thank you so much, ma'am, for getting me here. So what, uh, like I've been hearing all of you all and making my notes also on that. So very exciting to see what's going up on the higher education level. What I have understood while working with CBSC for some years is that what is happening on the higher level that influences the lower level. So supposing graduation, we need to do this particular topic. The base has to come up from 12th, 10th, 9th, 8th, 7th. That is the way it goes. I always thought it was the other way around. What we do in first, second, third leads us to 12th and above. In reality, it is not so. It goes the other way. But that's the way it is because the college people need to let the school people know what do they want the children to know before they enter into college. So it goes up that order. It took me some time to understand that system. But what really has impressed me in the past uh, pandemic is I'm supposed to be more on the creative binge and of course, a normal teacher in school with teaching normal children, but my pedagogies have been very, very different. I come from Bombay, Jamnabai Nasi school as a project school. So my genes come from there. I used to always do theater, 
converting books into academic plays so whatever activity i do i don't make it like a play without any academic portion in it so for me it was a whole accountancy textbook of class 11 converted into a three hour production that was my forte secondly we were always constantly doing exhibitions you know theater was also mean of presentation exhibitions were also there and a lot of experiential thing happening when i entered the museum platform we didn't know what i was going to do there but we created history festivals picking up from jlf we picked up and called it jaipur history festival where we converted history academically from 11th and 12th on to stage then we took 9th 10th 11th 12th the pedagogies were numerous we had exhibits we we had case studies we had plays we had dances just name it and everything possible was there so it was a nice three day four day festival a lot of children you know maybe around 6000 students walked into the museum and saw everything live around them and then bank in pandemic along with pandemic was also the national education policy 2020 so they were together trying to put challenges on us as to what were we going to do now so the first thing when the national education policy came what i understood as a not a very technical qualified person oh they are trying to say that education should be fun but that was my motto from the very beginning i wanted to make studies fun so we started picking up things first we knew there were challenges coming up very strongly because children could not access teachers and uh, online classes was absolutely new to so many people so along with cbsc we prepared the first podcast of class 8 9 10 11 12th and we were able to manage chapters converted into audio lessons for all the subjects but we had a luckily a base because just a few years back we had done this for the uh, hearing aid uh, the visually impaired children we had prepared podcast for them so it was easy for us to you know adapt that change some years back we had made one graphic novel on french revolution and sitting at home i realized what to do so we got hold of with around 150 schools and we trained them online as to how to make graphic novels so it's a comic book within a year we had 100 comic books ready and look at the luck factor with us that the comic book is approved not only by cbsc it's approved by the 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 ncrt so they have given their you know uh, say uh, this poster on that you just have to click on it and when you click on it you will automatically come to the textbook and if you click on the textbook this comic book will open so i didn't know how it happened it was all in destiny that we were given the approval of that by none other than uh, uh, ncrt we finished off 100 and we are in the process of making around 300 more so the target is that we need to make 1000 to cover all ncrt topics of school level converted into comic books or we call it technically the graphic novel a lot of challenge came up because we were doing experiential learning earlier which was happening in schools but how could we do it online so there we had this one special school in uh, special in the sense because of the work that they do mahatma gandhi international school from ahmedabad the couple anju and pascal both helped us out and we were able to do experiential learning with so many schools online with the children so everything became that in this situation itself we can do experiential learning without reaching the school premises without having a group set we can do it in individual capacity also and my forte was exhibitions so all of a sudden challenges came up sandeep what will happen to your exhibitions i said no we are doing graphic novels now what is there for me to do exhibition as but pondering that thought I said I cannot do exhibition until I don't have my thirty forty students. I teach them first, and then we decide to exhibit things. I have no students. We identified twenty five schools across the country, and we picked up two two students from each. The principals the volunteered, and we taught them for four months. Finished the entire eleven standard accountancy and the commerce course, and after that, during the pandemic time, we trained them how to make apps. and games online and we conducted a virtual exhibition of the entire commerce system and inevitably cbsc was very happy to see that and they are now wanting to put up on the diksha platform so that anyone can there download the app 
and play games in accountancy. Now, you know, when you talk about innovation, oh, I know that we were doing that. You talk about inclusion, well, we were catering to a lot of different uh, problems faced by students. And you spoke about partnership. Here, the museum was partnership, partnering with uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi International School as well as CBSC. So it was a lovely thing happening. What happened more was another term called uh, collaborative work. Because when you make a graphic novel, you have to get it vetted by three different schools. So look at the collaboration happening there. Other people were checking your work. So there were other events happening wherein schools were collaborating with each other. And this had not happened before the pandemic. Everyone wanted to work in isolation, but came pandemic and everyone was excited to work in collaboration. <laughs> Another thing which came up there was like, we're just having this workshop right now in the palace is as per the national education policy, removing of the bag, wanting to have education fund, we are creating board games for different subjects. So there's one created with the base of Panchantantra, the Thirsty Crow, which goes along not from grade one or two, goes from grade one to grade 10, covering a lot of concepts in it. There's another game just created on adversity. And I think we are around 24 schools working right now outside this room. So I think we'll be coming up with around 20 odd more games in the coming few months. So I was just seeing how that pandemic led us to what we are doing right now and what the national education policy states. We were able to pick up all those things there. And two more challenging things we picked up in this uh, tenure was skill education manuals for 6th, 7th, 8th. So if you look at the policy, it is saying that skill education has to come down to class 6th, 7th, 8th. Don't wait for it to come up 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. College can look at another front. So we have around 20 schools creating the manuals on them on topics like how to make a graphic novel, uh, handmade paper, blue pottery, block printing, things like that, again, across the country. And just to conclude, we are working on a project called now Education Through Monuments. So we've taken up a pilot project in the Jaipur Pink City, where we've got the Amir Fort, uh, not the Amir Fort, sorry, the Jaigar Fort, the City Palace, Hava Mel and Jantar Mantar. Four schools collaborating with each other with four monuments, not looking at only the history part, looking at the maths, physics, chemistry, biology, and other subjects in those monuments. So what I'm seeing was that when we came from top to bottom is what you all tell us what to teach. But I think what the schools are doing right now is from bottom to top as to how to teach. So the pedagogies are coming very strongly from the younger classes. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sandeep uh, Sethiji. It's been an absolutely fascinating journey that you've taken us through. And uh, we don't have that much time because each of the points that have been made by the speakers uh, requires a great deal of intensive discussion, thinking. Thank you very much for putting these ideas on the platform. What I'm taking away at the moment are two points that one can develop further. One, the need for experiential learning, which one of you has talked about, particularly when Professor Jeffrey spoke about partnerships. This would mean university and somebody else. When Professor Shailendra Mehta spoke in terms of the older knowledge systems and how we're adapting them, that again means some kind of socially beneficial output that goes back into improving the situation around us. And as you mentioned, you're directly working with school children. So interdisciplinarity is another thing which seems to be the direction in which learning, whether it's school learning or higher learning, is moving. So would any of you have a brief comment to make on uh, interdisciplinarity and uh, also the uh, kind of experiential work that you find as a major shift in the pedagogy of learning? Yes, please. I, I wanted to, um, I, I've been absolutely inspired by, by what Sandeep was, was saying about his work. and uh, I'm very humbled by uh, what Professor Mehta was saying about the, the, the tradition in, in India. Um, I, I wanted to add a slightly different dimension and, and possibly in the other way for, for, from Sandeep, and, and that is beyond uh, school, beyond normal university age. Now, I, th I think because of the pace of technological change, uh, we need higher education uh, at different stages in people's lives. It's not just something for 
school leavers. It's just not, not something for, for 18, 19, 20 uh, year olds. And I think that's going to make us think very, very hard about experiential learning because these will be people in their careers with experience. And we're going to have to unbundle what we do. We're going to have to, uh, to some extent, get rid of the idea of the degree. You know, this great big chunk of learning that we do at 18 years old or so uh, and, and offer smaller bite-sized pieces of higher education better attuned to experienced uh, learners and better attuned to helping them into the next stage of their careers. If they need to upskill, uh, if they lose their job and need to develop skills for, for a different area of work. I, I think that's going to be a really big challenge for uh, an educational system like, like ours in the UK, which is um, funded and has developed around the notion of the degree. Uh, we're going to have to disrupt ourselves um, so that we can offer that lifelong learning uh, which I think will be in demand much, much more in the future. Mr. Mehta, would you like to come in quickly? Yes, please. Um, fascinating. So let me pick up on what Jeffrey just mentioned, which is the notion of lifelong learning, right? So uh, when, a, when a student uh, graduates from MICA, they have 40 years ahead of them in terms of their working life, right? In those 40 years, they may have changed seven or eight jobs. They may have changed four or five major roles and they would have lived through three or four technology epochs. So how do you how do you prepare somebody right up front for that? Well, you can't. The thing that you can do is make them completely comfortable with change. And uh, the way in which we have done that is that we have made them, um, uh, it's, we've made it mandatory for them to launch a business while they're with us for two years. Of course, this doesn't apply to the PhD program, but if they're in the MBA program, then while they are for, with us, not only do they have to take courses in entrepreneurship, but they're all focused on launching a business. And we expect that most of them will fail. But last year, 50 businesses, 49 actually, were launched, seven of which have gone into the second year. And I'm sure three or four will ultimately emerge as very strong uh, real uh, businesses, you know, that will employ people as opposed to take jobs. So you talked about, uh, uh, Professor Jeffrey, you talked about carbon neutrality and carbon negativity. We want to talk about job neutrality and job negativity. That is to say, our graduates should give more jobs to the system than they take from the system over the course of their working life. So that is the direction in which uh, we wish to go. And very briefly, how do we do continuing learning? We build cohorts of our alumni because, you know, based on what stage they are, and typically they will go through six stages over those 40 years. I won't go into the details, but we break them up by those six cohorts. We bring them together and there is peer-to-peer -peer learning supervised by one of our faculty as they progress through life. Thank you very much. Uh, Sandeep ji. We have uh, just about a minute to go, but it would be lovely for you to have some kind of a statement on this issue, which is fascinating. What really uh, excites me is that when you're thinking of entrepreneurial as a compulsion in your graduation and MBA classes, and uh, not all, but a lot of good schools, a lot of very passionate teachers, like a person like me, when I used to teach commerce, they would tell me, oh, it's a mini MBA program. So I knew that, you know, when the comment came like that from some people, I thought, well, we are doing the right thing because we could introduce it on a smaller scale on school level, maybe in a school canteen or something like that, just to change the mindset. So what you are doing at the top, very excitedly, a lot of little, little things are happening at the bottom. So then obviously the meet is going to happen uh, on a very good note. And I'm really excited about one particular day when we realized that, oh, yes, why can't we convert a college academic mathematical portion of physics one into a two-hour production of theater. I'm waiting for that if anyone wants to have it happen. And believe me, they may not be my subjects, but we can do that. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you, everyone. That's wonderful. Thank you, everybody. But what I'm absolutely excited about is the passion that each one of you has brought to the subject of education. And I share that passion myself. And so long as this fire is there, we want the innovation, we want good to go to society, we will find the means 
by which to shift education towards a purposeful direction and bring the benefits of learning, whether it's school learning or university learning, we bring the benefits to the society around us locally as well as globally. So thank you very much. It's been a very exciting journey that you have taken us through in your own uh, institution, as well as in the whole pedagogy of higher learning and school learning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charlie, Shailendra, Sandeep, Malashri, and Rashmi for a wonderful session. The session is presented by York University. And thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us. The series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. Sessions are ongoing across all three of our venues, Frontlawn, Mughal Tent, and Darbar Hall. Stay tuned for the next sessions. Mm -hmm.